Here are all the companies I could find who are making quantum computers and their current highest qubit counts. I've arranged them according to the approach to quantum computing that they're taking, and I explained these different approaches in my last video, The Map of Quantum Computing, so you may want to watch that as well if you haven't seen it. The yellow numbers are for universal quantum computing qubits, and the orange numbers are for a range of different non-universal quantum computers or simulators, things that are really interesting, but you can't compare them directly with the universal quantum computers. For completeness, I've also included a load of non-hardware companies and software packages as well. Now, you've probably noticed that there are a lot of companies where I haven't filled in the number of qubits yet. That's because I couldn't find that information. We know lots of startups are actively working on their machines, but they haven't released information on them yet. Also, apologies if I've made any mistakes here or left anyone out. As you can see, the field has grown massively over the last few years, and I had to draw the line somewhere on the research, but this is my best effort. Also, things are moving very quickly. So this captures the field in January of 2022, but this will likely go out of date quite quickly. But I thought it would be cool to capture a snapshot right now. Now, if we're trying to figure out who's building the best quantum computers, we really can't just look at the qubit counts on their own because the number of qubits in a machine is really not a very good way of comparing different quantum systems. For example, a thousand low quality, high noise qubits will perform less well than say 10 high quality, low noise qubits. And also not all of these qubit counts meet the full requirements to count as a fully fledged quantum computer, a set of conditions called Di Vincenzo's criteria. But I'll be honest, I found it quite difficult to figure out who meets the criteria and who doesn't, but it's something worth knowing about. So I'd say in the future when press releases and news reports come out, don't be satisfied with just the qubit counts. For us outside the industry, we need more information to be able to tell how advanced a company's quantum computers are, because there are lots of factors that play into the performance of a quantum computer beyond the number of qubits, like error rates or crosstalk, connectivity, even the classical software that links to the quantum computers. But fortunately, there is a way we can compare different systems regardless of their underlying architecture through a benchmarking scheme called quantum volume. Quantum volume is a metric designed by IBM to tell us how effective a given quantum computer is. And it's really important to have a good objective metric that can be run on any machine so that we can sensibly talk about how good they are in comparison to each other. And also this helps people set goals for the future that are actually measurable. And quantum volume is the best metric we have so far. You can run this test on any universal quantum computer, and even though the underlying architecture of the qubits may be different, or how they're connected, or the level of noise in the system is different, this test gives you a single number, the quantum volume, which you can then compare between different devices. Quantum volume is defined as the largest square circuit your quantum computer can solve. Now, a circuit is essentially a list of instructions for the computer, basically an algorithm of instructions for the qubits. Here's an example, and in this picture we have the number of qubits involved in the calculation on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis we have got the number of time steps. And these boxes in the middle are the operations, so the instructions for the qubits that happen in sequence. First these, then these, then these, then these. And this example, because it involves four qubits and four time steps, this is a four by four square circuit, which corresponds to a quantum volume of 16. And each time you add one more qubit and one more time step, the quantum volume doubles, as shown here. Here are the recent high scores for quantum volume. The machine with the current highest quantum volume is a trapped ion quantum computer by Quantinuum, a company formed from the merger of Honeywell and Cambridge Quantum. Their machine has 12 qubits and a current quantum volume of 2048. IBM's 127 qubit superconducting quantum computer has a current quantum volume of 128. So you can see how a machine with just 12 qubits is performing better under this metric than one with 128 qubits. Now the thing is, to my knowledge, no one else has published their quantum volume numbers, so we aren't yet able to compare all of the different quantum computers with each other using quantum volume. And also, although quantum volume is a good metric for now, we know we'll need other metrics in the future. 
We know we'll need other metrics in the future because quantum volume doesn't take into account, for example, how long it takes to solve the problem, so what the throughput of the quantum computers are. So another metric proposed by IBM called CLOPS addresses this issue. It's basically aiming to be the quantum version of flops in classical computers. Also, for quantum volume to work, you need to be able to solve the problems on classical computers first using quantum simulators, which presumably is going to be impossible in the future as quantum computers get more advanced. So to answer who is the best quantum computer right now, according to the published quantum volume, it's Continuum System Model H12. However, this may well go out of date quite quickly, which brings us to the final part of the video, what does the future of quantum computing look like over the next few years? Now, it's worth saying that none of the quantum computers that exist today can yet do anything useful. They can't solve any real-world problem any better than the computers that we already have. So here's the overall roadmap, the problems people need to solve to make a useful quantum computer. This list was taken from the Google Quantum Technology blog, and I've linked to it below. First, they need to implement error correction, combining several physical qubits together to make a single error corrected qubit, which has lower noise called a logical qubit. They need to build this because the information stored in a qubit degrades over time, ruining the calculations. And error correction is the way to fix this. Then they need to show that as they add more and more physical qubits together, the error correction gets better and better, not worse and worse. Then they need to show that they can use this error correction to create a single logical qubit that can then be kept coherent forever, so they're able to continually move the noise away and preserve the quantum state for as long as they like. They'll need an estimated 1,000 physical qubits for a single logical qubit at the current error rates, but people are thinking that they'll also need to reduce this physical error rate, which would then mean fewer qubits are needed in the error correction. And then they need to create two of these error-corrected logical qubits to form a quantum transistor, which then will be able to perform two qubit operations, a key element of a universal quantum computer. And finally, they need to figure out how to tile hundreds or thousands of these together to make a full-scale error-corrected quantum computer. Currently, people are working on tasks one and two, and every single one of these tasks is a huge engineering challenge. But this is what everyone is aiming to accomplish. So the burning question is, how soon will we get through this list? Well, personally, because I don't work at any of these companies, I've got no idea. But many of the companies have set out goals for the next few years, so let's take a look at what they're predicting. IBM, which currently has 127 superconducting qubits, has a plan to have a 433 qubit machine in 2022, then over 1,000 qubits by 2023. They've also mentioned up to 1 million plus qubits in 2026 and beyond, which is quite vague, but the 1 million qubit number is significant because that seems to be roughly how many qubits you need to be able to run error-corrected quantum algorithms, so how many you'd need for a useful quantum computer. Google, which currently has 53 superconducting qubits, is also aiming for a useful error-corrected quantum computer by the end of the decade. So again, about a million physical qubits by 2030 with working error correction. D-Wave currently has a quantum annealing chip with 5,760 qubits, which isn't a universal quantum computer, it's a quantum annealer, so currently we can't compare that with the others. They have a plan to build over 7,000 qubits by 2024. And also they've said that they're starting to work on a universal gate model quantum computer. Rigetti currently has 80 superconducting qubits and says they'll have 1,000 qubits by 2024 and 4,000 by 2026. SciQuantum, who build optical quantum computers, say that they'll have hundreds of logical qubits, that's logical qubits, not physical qubits, and billions of gates by mid-decade, so 2025. Although I couldn't find how many qubits they have right now. So this is the most ambitious prediction so far. ColdQuanta, who work on atoms in optical tweezers, say that they'll have a thousand qubits by 2024. Ion Q have a very detailed plan for the number of qubits they'll build over the next few years, and they're saying that these are algorithmic qubits rather than physical qubits, so their actual physical qubit numbers will be higher. 
But these physical qubits, like I've said, will be combined together to make error-corrected qubits. Pascal and Cuera both have quantum simulators right now, but are aiming to convert those into quantum computers and get about 1,000 qubits by around 2024-2025. And this 1,000 qubit number by then seems to be a bit of a theme on this table. And silicon quantum computing is aiming for 10 qubits next year and 100 error-corrected qubits by the end of the decade. So this is interesting to look at, and I'm going to be following along closely to see how the industry keeps up with these predictions, and if I find out anything cool, I'll let you know here. Obviously, this isn't all of the companies, and I'm sure that the other companies have internal goals and predictions, but these are the ones that I could find online. And if these predictions hold up, it looks like we'll have useful general purpose quantum computers in about eight years. But the thing I'd like to see in the future when companies release their latest news on their latest quantum computers is not just to state the qubit counts, but also confirm that they meet DiVincenzo's criteria and also publish the results of the quantum volume or whatever the latest best metric is. Because without these bits of information, us people outside of the industry really don't have enough information to critically analyze these claims. Um, so those would be good the habits for them to get into. But anyway, hopefully that puts you in a better position to know what to look out for and also gives you a good idea of the state of the industry right now. I think it's very exciting to see what's going to happen over the next few years, especially if people keep track with those predictions. Well, that's it from me. Thanks so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, hooray! Oh yeah, like and subscribe, oh, bollocks.